Activists, artists, and citizens from nearly all walks of life and perspectives have struggled to reach beyond the limits of mainstream media. Whether it's Fox News or the New York Times, Rush Limbaugh or Brian Williams, people say they are tired of being talked to or overlooked. They seek to exercise their own rights to free speech, to fulfill a need to hear from independent voices. They exercise their rights and fulfill their needs by creating new avenues for speech, by inventing new forms of communication, and by seizing the microphone to speak to their community. This movement did not begin and does not end with the internet or social media. It is a movement as old as the dawn of mass media. This series will highlight the contributions of alternative media and the challenges citizens face in a political environment that seems to reward only those with the most money, a political environment that does not necessarily reward those with the best ideas or those who serve the critical information needs of their community. We're looking beyond mainstream media. My name is Mark Lloyd. I'm the director of the Media Policy Initiative here at the New America Foundation. This is a program with an interview focusing on an independent filmmaker, Kevin McKinney, who has done a fascinating documentary on what has happened to corporate FM radio. What brings me, motivates me, I'll answer that first, mm -hmm. is I love my community. I, I love seeing my community be able to unite with itself. And I, that happened a lot where I used to, used to live in Lawrence, Kansas, in Kansas City, Missouri, and in other, I'm a military brat. Everywhere I lived, the, this whole city was united by this commercial radio station. And in some of those places, that commercial radio station had vision. And, and that's, that's what led me to, to make this movie, because I saw that drop off, and I saw the consequences of that in my local music scene, in the charities. I, I saw it across the board in different ways. Now, to be a, an independent filmmaker today, mm -hmm. that's, where, that's where I am today. And you know, my shoes, they're, they're worn. Um, and, and, so, and I like that. But uh, one reason I'm here is I'm trying to get this movie out. I'm showing it to very small but interested groups. I'm going to. Or I'm traveling the nation, going to LPFMs as they as they blossom, as they try to put that you know that antenna in the ground and, and helping them uh, unite their audience. Because there's one thing that this movie does is it makes you very conscious of this communications medium that reaches everyone in a concentrated area called radio, and that's that's what I'm doing now. Uh, now this this is not your first documentary. This is not my first documentary, but this is my first feature film that, you know, I'm the producer and director, and I shot a lot of it on it. I, I, did a, I wore a lot of hats on mm -hmm. this one. Mm -hmm. And so where, where does the money come for this? <laughs> uh, you know, when I work in this medium, I help other filmmakers. Uh, I helped uh, Phil Donahue on his movie Body of War. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I, I, I work with a lot of corporations, too, to help them get their message either out or within their, their, their microcosm, a huge corporation. I, I, I do all these other things. I wear these other hats. Uh, I make films, uh, fundraisers for uh, nonprofits. So that pays my bills. And it makes me also take longer to make a film. It took me seven years to make this film. And it's a better film because of that, for all kinds of reasons. Technology changed. TV is a different shape now. Um, than when I started, and uh, I became much, much a better filmmaker. As, as you watch yourself interview people over seven years, you make a lot of mistakes, and you learn from those. So um, many folks who study media, who sort of think about media, would say that the way that you approach this seems to be somehow outside of the uh, economic drive of uh, capturing millions of audiences uh, and raising millions of dollars. So what, how, how do you somehow fit outside of this, this model of economic drive? Why, why aren't you simply trying to like, make a lot of money and get people to watch, I don't know, uh, another Superman movie or something? I am trying to make a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. So, so what, 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 what's happening here? <laughs> um, I, I believe the death of commercial radio and the death of a lot of mediums we, we see, uh, uh, whether it's newspapers, a lot of it comes down to content. 
And if there isn't great content on that FM dial, you're not going to turn it on. And if you can afford it, you'll get one of those smartphones and figure out how to hook it into your car, if, if you can afford it. Uh, so, but here I am, I'm creating content. And I know there's an intelligent audience out there that wants great, entertaining content. So I believe that I'm on the path to, you know, making it somehow with this movie. I know it. I know it. You guys are smart. The audience is not fifth graders. And if they were, they'd still like it because I have to tell you that kids come up to me, high schoolers come up to me after screenings and they're like, whoa, you've got to show this to people. Because it matters to them that they get the latest and greatest thing. They, they want to they, they, they hear the new song and they're ticked off that they can't. And, and isn't, isn't that a challenge? I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you show it to people? Uh, and it, would it be enough for you simply to put on a little clip on YouTube and, and maybe you know, have people pay for it, you know, and how, how do you get it out to the masses of people? Right. Uh, the whole YouTube, you know, put it on YouTube and, you know, they will come. That's, that's a great dream, and it is a dream because you think about the Internet, and we'll just contrast it with radio. Radio, you have limited choices within that spectrum. You know within you know a minute or two whether you, there's anything you want on that dial. Whereas the internet is infinite. You could go on for days and never find my my clip, whether it's great or not. If I have some you know cats in it, you know doing something that's kind of quirky that becomes viral, then you're you're more likely to find it. So the internet is not broadcasting; it's narrow casting to interested groups. Um, and luckily, you know, my, my, my son Simon is here and he's, uh, he is a demographic that unites, that creates new synergies through the internet because if there's a, uh, a particular, you know, laughing cat or something that has a song behind it, I know all the fifth graders know it. That is the closest thing we have to, to broadcasting that unites, you know, teenagers around a song. But you know, it's not in a concentrated area. They're not all meeting together. They're not going to unite and, and become a grow up together that way and, and transfer that unity to local bands, local charities. They, we, don't, we, we don't have the unity. I think I went way off base from your question. I forget no, what. Not, no <laughs> not, not, not at all. And so um, what about art houses, just independent movie houses? I mean, if, if, if YouTube is not the way for you to make money with this movie, uh, why wouldn't a distribution, Miramax or uh, Sony or someone else say, yeah, what a great documentary. Let me just you know, put this in all the independent film houses around the country. That could happen. That could happen. That could definitely happen. Uh, part, of, part of it is you know, I'm a Midwest filmmaker. I don't know the gatekeepers and what have you. Um, and I'm also coming from the ground up. I've, uh, I've done a lot of small festivals. I didn't have a premiere at Sundance. And if you do a premiere at Sundance, and then that kind of opens you up to you know, all the HBOs. And what. Right now, I, it's me. I'm a guy sending them a letter and a DVD. And they're like, you know, who are you? And I have 100 other DVDs here. What do I do? Uh, so uh, part of the reason I'm doing it, every time I do this, I meet someone who's like, I can help you out. And, that gets me miles ahead of uh, me writing lots of letters and sending out DVDs. Uh, I can also uh, get in my car and go around to art houses around the nation. They love showing stuff like this. And I, I, you know, I get to speak to you guys. And uh, some of those art houses have really nice uh, relationships with their audience where they just you know, email out and they, they get a good audience there on top of the audience that I bring there. How many people are here because they read about me on the radio in radio boards. Anyone here from the radio boards? See, there, I, I get some people from the radio boards. I did that two days ago. I posted something, and, and I got I got I got someone here. Okay, let's talk afterwards. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so let's. I have a I have a uh, very short. What what do they call? It? So you go to the movie theater and you see all these promotions for the next giant movie. So we have a little promotion for for the giant movie coming up that we're going to show just for the, the audience here. And then let's talk a little bit about Corporate FM. Okay. okay.
the problem with the internet is there's tons of good stuff out there and there are tons of good bands and tons of exciting bands but there's so much of it to wade through to get to what you like that while it's more democratic than it's ever been it also is very difficult in terms of the amount of stuff you have to wade through to find that one thing that really turns your crank whereas at least radio you know some jock was good about you know someone might like this the internet and satellite radio are often thought of as a replacement for our locally owned radio the latest emerging band in our own hometown can find diehard fans on the internet but that music how can it reach the rest of us who are too busy with family or work to search the internet? We may hear it on Pandora, but it's not while 20,000 of our neighbors are having that same experience at the exact same instant. We may hear it on community radio or college radio, but that does not reach near as big an audience as a professionally run commercial radio station. And so there's no concentrated rush to go out and see that band. It was our collective presence that moved these local bands off the bar stage and onto the arena stage. That's what's now missing. The problem is that these bands don't break out of that indie ghetto. I think the best time to be played would be during the morning and evening rush hours. As, as much play as we're all getting on corporate radio yes. right now, we'll just say, if you want to put us on at 3 a.m., we'll take it. Are you all right? I had to acknowledge it, otherwise it'd just seem like a gonk, you know. Wouldn't it be great if we got played on the radio? Um, it must be easy. You just take your record to them. You only give ear to bands that have distribution. If a band has pressed their own CD, and I don't care if they've sold 30,000 copies, if they aren't on a major label, they're not getting an air spin on, this, on any radio station. That's not a uh, midnight to 1 a.m. Sunday night show that's playing local music then on only then. Right now, I don't think there's shot in hell. Business. Business. <laughs> Money. Posh. Dollars. Pish posh. Yeah. <laughs> I want people to hear something that maybe they really, really like and didn't know was out there. That's why I do Homegrown. I do it for the bands because it's an outlet that they can't get anywhere else. And the corporations will argue we're not in the business of creating bands. What well, we used to be, we were in the business of helping a band called Shooting Star and a band called the Rainmakers. These were bands that were played before they had major recording contracts. Hell, before Shooting Star signed with Virgin, KY 102 played them constantly and were, were instrumental in helping them get signed. But there's no profit in that. We don't, what do we get for that? How much money do we make? I, I don't see it. I don't see the profit. The profit is, is KY 102 could always brag that we created these bands. We did. They started getting attention because radio said, that's a great song. I don't give a shit if it's not on a major label. I want to play it, and they did. There are a lot of little sub-scenes around the country. Williamsburg, Brooklyn, there are bands coming out of, and every college town in America, there's probably some good band that deserves exposure. The locals, what gives a city its flavor. Think about New Orleans. The music defines the city. Think about Memphis. Here in Kansas City in the 20s and 30s with the jazz. The music really defines the character of the city. And then it becomes a chain reaction. Once they get picked up by one radio station, they just, across the country, the radio stations pick it up. Elvis Presley first played on local Memphis radio. R.E.M. first played on Atlanta area and Athens, Georgia radio. Pearl Jam, Nirvana, Seattle. The Cars, Boston radio. The Ramones, New York Beck City first played on local L.A. radio. And I'm Danny Cox, and I first played on radio in Cincinnati, Ohio, my hometown, and it really jump-started my career. 
grunge rock and Nirvana and Smashing Pumpkins and, and Pearl Jam. A program director at a radio station heard those songs and loved them. That whole cultural movement was born on, on FM radio, and that couldn't happen today. And that was the last sort of um, gasp, I think, of, of rock radio. Uh, DJs, they barely even have live DJs anymore, let alone DJs that pick the music. If you're listening to a station on the weekends, there's nobody home. It's voice tracked. Nobody's there. Voice tracking is basically done by taking a computer, which already has all those elements, the songs and the commercials and the bumpers, it can run those automatically anyway just by putting them in a queue and going next, next, next. When you voice track, you don't have to listen to the songs or the commercial. You're just making a spreadsheet. There's also no way to change your playlist to reflect live audience reactions. You could put phone calls in there and kind of fake it. What would normally take five hours to do a show when you're sitting there in the studio you can voice track and be done with it in 15, 20 minutes. So you're paying one person to do the work of 10 people. And when you start taking away the people that make it alive, you just have this little assembly line process and, and now you've got something that's just dead. If it's five o'clock on a Friday afternoon and I'm voice tracking Sunday morning, if there's a fire downtown, I should be referring to it, but it hasn't happened yet when I'm voice tracking. A listener might see an accident and say, hey, you know, you might want to tell your listeners to avoid I-35 because it's backing up, you know, and uh, there's nobody there. Check this out. I'm a spaceship. I am a spaceship. Yes, I'm a spaceship. I am a spaceship. I'm a spaceship. I am a spaceship. Yes, I'm a spaceship. Yo, that's right. If one uh, gentleman or, or woman somewhere in a, in, a, in a corporate office is determining what, say, 35 to 55 or 100 radio stations are playing, let's say an artist puts out a song with a social comment or a political stance towards something, and it comes up to go for ads on, the, on this particular format, and Gentleman X here goes, you know what, I don't believe in that comment, so I'm going to instruct my radio stations to not add that song. One guy can affect what 30 million people get to hear. That's censorship. I interviewed John Mellencamp, who had the song To Washington, which came out right around the time of the Iraq War. And it was just sort of a redoing of a old Woody Guthrie song. And it was, you know, critical of the Bush administration. He played it for his record company. They didn't want it. What had just happened with the Dixie Chicks, it was the same label, it was Sony Music. Dixie Chicks got in a huge controversy over their statements about Bush. The record company wanted nothing to do with it. They told him he was crazy. And he said, no one wants songs with any sort of political message because they're just, it's so hard to have a hit record. It's so hard to have a career now. Why would you want to gunk it up with some intelligent statement or political statement? This is clearly a passion for you. This is not simply a money-making venture. <laughs> You're, you care about this. Why, why do you care about this? Um, I grew up in a town where the local commercial radio station played local bands in rotation. Now, when we get these LPFMs throughout the country, they will unite lots of small communities, but pay, playing a band in rotation is something that only commercial radio would, can do because you would not want your small 
public radio station to play the same song over and over again. It's, it's antithetical to diversity. Uh, so th they would, within the rotation of a normal rock schedule, they would you know, throw in that local band. And they, they had, of course, more, uh, a, a wider playlist than what we're hearing today. So it didn't burn you out. They did not burn out listeners. When that went away, uh, just going out to a club where they might have 200 people on a Wednesday night suddenly became 30 people. I noticed this, and I knew I knew I knew there was a a, a correlation. Uh, I think part of growing up as a military brat on a military base where the radio station, the Far East Network, you know, as a kid you could call in and request a song. I could see how that small act had ripples. Know, people who had no idea who you were knew who you were just because you called into the radio station. So when that went away, I was sad. And I wanted to see what I could do to, to, to figure out why it was happening. And, and if it wouldn't have taken me seven years, I don't think we would have figured it out why. Because there, there, something wasn't making sense because they were selling these stations for more and more money, but the audience is shrinking. So doesn't it make sense that they would sell for less if the audience is shrinking? Why does the station price go up? So one of the things that, that, that you and I have talked about before is the idea of local radio being uh, almost a glue for local communities. Um, we, we've done a program here about the importance of low power FM. Does, does low power FM sort of step into that that void that that corporate FM seems to have destroyed. Uh, absolutely, it steps in the void, but it can't fill it. You can't fill a hundred thousand watts with how many watts is a low power? One hundred watts. Uh, it would take a lot of low power FM stations, but even then, you know, they all have different content, so you don't have that unity. What LPFM does that is awesome is it introduces music to the community that. That jock uh, at the commercial radio station might hear, and they could be either shamed into playing it, or they could be they could play it out of love. It could it could happen. Um, also, uh, LPFM exposes the media consolidation issue better than anyone else. You do you don't hear media consolidation even on NPR. It's not a, like a drum beat. Whereas a, at a LPFM. The reason they are there is they are there because they're needed, because the, the big guys aren't filling the need for diversity. Most of the time when I show this movie, it's the people who radio is wallpaper to them, and all of a sudden they feel like something's been stolen to them, stolen from them. And that's why I encourage you to help me spread the message, because you, you have the ability just by sharing this with someone through whatever means. I know you've mentioned that YouTube and the internet and all is, is spread too thin to get really get the critical local mass, but do you see no possibility at all for the internet, um, especially the internet radio stations, um, to maybe come and, and get a, a foot in the door or maybe begin to fill this gap? Is there no possibility? Um, for that to take hold on a more local level? Sure. Um, I think internet radio stations, in fact, I'll tell you in the movie, there's that one fellow that had the shirt that said, marijuana is my anti-drug at popfreeradio.com. Uh, he shut down that station when he had a baby, and he realized he couldn't make it at two, on $200 profit a month on top of what he was, you know, everything he put in it, he, he could not make it. Now, if you were in Brooklyn, and you have that, there's a, there's a great radio station, not in Brooklyn, in uh, East Village, there's a, a great uh, internet radio station that has a storefront, so people walking by can see it, and that population also has these things, uh, smartphones. Um, then it, it, then there, there's definitely is a, a possibility there, if, you know, if your whole audience is in their 20s and 30s, yeah, I think it could work, but out for the rest of the continent, uh, I don't see that that happening. Uh, not the way, and I'm not saying it's not impossible. No, you can have a, you can have an internet radio station. There's plenty of them out there. But to have to create local critical masses behind bands that are playing, 
Um, I don't see that happening, no. There's an assumption, I guess, that radio survived television um, and that it can uh, survive the Internet as well. And I, the challenge I have for that assumption is that television was a mass media, as was radio. The Internet is a different animal. Um, and the kids coming up listen and expose themselves to media in a very different way than radio traditionally has done. Mm -hmm. So my question is not necessarily around, you know, how does radio, um, how does that differ from the previous challenge, but more what can hyper-local radio do to adopt some of the best practices of the Internet to survive and thrive if, in fact, the pendulum does swing back and it, it does surface? I think that's an excellent question because, you know, the, a lot of commercial radio stations will say, hey, you know, we just fired this lump of people here because we have, we have the Internet, you know, had, we had to fire them. Uh, but any enterprising business is going to use the Internet to gain audience. And one thing that, uh, and in fact, in the beginning, they were telling their jocks, don't, don't push people to the Internet because we want them to be on the radio. Uh, no, th th they need to be Facebooking, Twittering, and all that stuff to, to build their shows, to build their, their audience. Uh, it's absolutely hand in hand. The Internet's a tool uh, to be used. It, we're, we're not, I think it's funny when there are companies that change their names from broadcast companies to media companies, because that's actually watering down their brand. What makes them unique is that they are broadcast companies. Any one of us is a media company. You have a web page. Uh, you know, my son has a, you know, he's a media company with this, <laughs> you look at me, yeah, if he has a, a big enough presence, he, he has media, he, he is media. So, yeah, absolutely. The internet is a tool to, to gain your audience. I work in media buying, so I kind of have a little different uh, perspective than you were saying. Um, I think, uh, first of all, I want to say there was a really a key insight in the movie is that localization is the future, not the past. And I think that gives me hope for radio going somewhere. I don't know if you're familiar with like low power FM and what's happening there. I hope you're using this movie to promote that um, around the country because there's a bunch of licenses up. So if you want to be involved with the radio station, make sure to get hooked in with those folks. You said the future is local, but actually the present is local. It's, the present has always been local. And that's what has driven a lot of these stations to the ground is they forgot that or it didn't matter because they were making their money through the fees of the, of the finance industry. And it did not matter that their asset served its people or not. It did not matter that the asset made money. So uh, really, to be ahead of the next wave really is to be part of what's happening now. To have your reporters in the field right now, to, to be giving, I, I don't believe you can create a, or should create a station, well, that is both local and is trying to serve, you know, a different city at the same time. There is someone in that city that's going to do it better. But you could pool resources to where when there are stories in either city, you are, as NPR does, you have the national network and you have your local reporters. That's the strength of NPR. That's why NPR listeners are so loyal is because they, they know us, they know our communities, and they know the next community over, so we not, we're not getting something watered down when it comes to world news or national news. Mm -hmm.